tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We will enact additional measures if necessary. No safe six. The health region hoping to restrict gatherings to household members only also. The rules are in place for everybody and we need to abide by them if we want the kids on the field. Red carded. Oh, oh, oh. A children's soccer club hires security guards after parents rage against COVID-19 rules and if you're digging into your candy hall on the go, keep hand sanitizer with you. Be calm, be kind, be safe. How to ensure you have a happy Halloween. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. When it comes to raw case numbers, few reports from the province on COVID-19 have been worse than today's. 287 new cases to tell you about, and the Fraser Health region's big contribution to that tally shows no sign of slowing. The region accounts for two-thirds of today's cases. The positivity rate there, 4.7%, well above the latest provincial rate of 2.8%. There are 2,316 active cases across the province. Two more people have died. For a total now of 261. 87 people are in hospital, 25 in intensive care. And in the area of BC hardest hit by COVID-19, a warning tonight from health officials there. Tighter restrictions could be coming if cases continue to skyrocket. Fraser Health, which includes Surrey, is already telling residents to limit gatherings and residences to household members only. That's a step further than Dr. Bonnie Henry's household members plus safe six order from Monday. Tina Lovgreen explains what's considered safe to do in the region ravaged by the virus. Just five months ago, these restaurants were shuttered, ordered to close during the first wave of COVID-19. We take the details of all our guests that come into the restaurant um, and that's for contact tracing. But now, with their increased safety protocols... We've got some hand sanitizer set up as well, immediately as you walk in. They are the places where Fraser Health is urging people to gather. To ask everyone, for now, to minimize social interactions at home by not having events or parties at home. You can still socialize with your safe six in a licensed facility such as restaurants and hotels. The fact that we just allow a max of six people uh, to sit at that table and don't allow there's a lot less chance for the touching and, and getting closer to each other, whereas if you're at a house party or anything like that, it may be different. That would be the big difference from coming to the restaurant versus uh, being at home. The region is a hot spot when it comes to COVID. Of the more than 800 new cases of COVID-19 reported in BC over the weekend, 81% are from the Fraser Health area, despite having around 40% of the province's population. The spike in cases linked to people playing fast and loose with health and safety protocols, especially when it comes to weddings, funerals and gender reveal parties. The region's health authority now saying the province's safe six rule is too risky here. We are putting additional recommendation not to have private parties and events in household. You can still have your safe six in terms of social interactions, but not parties and events. The restaurant says it hasn't had a case of COVID-19 yet, thanks to its strict safety measures and hopes to keep it that way. Well, we don't want to close again. I definitely don't want to go through that. So whatever we can do to avoid that from happening, we're going to do it. While the region tries to clamp down on private parties and the celebrations that are fueling the spread. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. And later in this newscast, I will be speaking to Dr. Victoria Lee, President and CEO of Fraser Health. We'll hear her thoughts on the pandemic response in her health authority and whether th she thinks more needs to be done to try to flatten the curve. Well, soccer moms and dads are on notice after a stern warning from a league in the Fraser Valley. Chilliwack FC has had to hire security guards after the parents of several players took their anger out on contact tracers. As John Hernandez reports, organizers say some heated arguments almost turned violent. This soccer field is supposed to bring kids together, but last weekend a group of parents cast a dark shadow over the game. I was appalled and I know the rest of the executive is appalled. A near violent altercation when an enraged parent lashed out. 
all came to a head when one of our contact tracers who was treated very poorly at a venue uh, was verbally, uh, basically verbally assaulted and ignored, went home in tears. The incident, just the latest at this field, as frustrations mount over limited seating and other safety measures. The club issued a letter to parents saying the abuse and poor behavior has to stop. A security guard has been hired to keep parents in line. But unfortunately, we're bound by the policies by the health office, and I, I think they just saw a, an opportunity to take it out on somebody, and unfortunately, they took it out on that poor lady. Well, I was shocked, really, to begin with. Coach Jamie Benton says it's a small group of parents causing trouble. It's unfortunate that it's had to be done. Um, I'm in favour of it. Uh, it's unfortunate they've had to supply, uh, you know, um, get a, a security company involved and spend money on that instead of actually investing that in in, in the soccer program. Similar incidents have happened elsewhere in the Lower Mainland. That same weekend, an altercation at a ringette practice inside the West Vancouver Ice Arena when a group of hockey parents entered the complex when they weren't supposed to. One man refused to leave. I think for a lot of people, it feels as though the rules are changing too quickly to keep up with, and they're not quite sure what the right thing is. Mediator Ashley Sire says these types of conflicts are widespread, happening in transit, stores, even the workplace. Mindfulness really, really is key. You know, Bonnie Henry's mantra, right? Be kind, uh, be calm. You know, if, if you see that somebody is reacting in a way that feels like a very strong reaction to you, you don't know what's going on in their life. When tensions flare, she says it's important to be patient and leave enforcement up to those with authority. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. As work life has come into the home for many Canadians, some here in Vancouver have counted on migrant care workers to help them through the pandemic. But now some of those workers say some employers are using the pandemic against them. As Magda Gabra Salase explains, they're now looking for protection. Overworked, underpaid caring for the young and old in private homes. Today, already vulnerable migrant care workers, now under pressure in a pandemic, spoke out. I was working from 7.30 in the morning to 7 p.m. and watching the kids, but I keep being paid, same as before. I was exhausted. It feels very sad. This woman shared what happened with her last employer with advocacy groups. From July to September, they carried out a small survey. About 200 of Canada's 25,000 workers responded. Mostly racialized women filled out a survey sharing their experiences of abuse, exploitation, fear, and stress. They did so by text, social media, and emails. Advocates were troubled by what they heard. Employers are also refusing to let workers leave the homes because of COVID-19. They were using COVID-19 as an excuse. Now it's calling for the government to protect these workers, including making them permanent residents now. Harpreet Kaur says she applied late last year and is still waiting. Meanwhile, her work permit will soon expire. That is why I'm scary right now. When my work permit expire, my health card will also expire. This academic says there's a power imbalance between employers and migrant workers. That can only be fixed by giving permanent resident status to essential workers. And this means workers in all sorts of industries and employment environments. The government says it's committed to fixing some unacceptable gaps brought to light by the pandemic, saying that includes considering new pathways to permanent residents. Magda Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Toronto. An anti-LGBTQ street preacher has turned himself into police after allegedly breaking a man's leg in a confrontation in August in Vancouver's West End. Dore Shepherd Love and another man were preaching when they were confronted by sportscaster Justin Morissette, who yelled and swore at them and snatched their mic. He said his leg was snapped in the following confrontation. Love faces a charge of aggravated assault. He has a court date set for next month. The Vancouver police have now identified the homicide victim found in the water near Kitts Point as 57-year-old Vancouver resident Douglas Wanky. Wanky's remains were found in a large recycling bin October 18th. 
The Canadian Coast Guard recovered the bin after several calls from people out on the water. Frankie's death is the city's 15th homicide of the year. The investigation is ongoing. Anyone with information is asked to call police or Crime Stoppers. And the VPD's latest snapshot of crime in Vancouver shows a sharp hike in hate crime and that the city's Asian community is bearing the brunt of that hate. Stats released yesterday show anti-Asian hate crimes have doubled and then some up 138 percent. That's when comparing January to September of 2019 to the same period this year. VPD is also tracking hate incidents. They say that's when someone might shout a racial slur without necessarily also committing a crime. Anti-Asian hate incidents are up almost 900%. I believe it has to do with COVID-19 starting, how it originated in China, and we had people in this city, unfortunately, preying on the Asian community. So it was very disheartening to see those numbers. Uh, we felt like not enough people were coming forward um, for fear of police, or they just feel like this wasn't a reportable crime. So we made a public plea. We asked more people to come forward, and in return, people came forward, and, and we had more crimes to investigate. The report also notes that violent crime stayed relatively stable compared to last year, while property crime is down by about 20%. All right, time now for our first look at the forecast and more just before we get to some uh, big news out of Rivers Inlet. Last night we stuck with our musical theme. We had uh, Prince, the, the purple sky in behind you. How about some earth, wind and fire tonight? Like, that is just incredible. Oh, Mike, you are on fire. Yeah, that is the perfect <laughs> reference for what's happening behind me. A stunning sunset. We're going to lose it any minute now. So, uh, yeah, if you can sneak a peek out the windows, it's it's another nice one tonight. We got by with a mainly dry night, but uh, as Mike, uh, you alluded to, things are much more serious farther to our north. I want to show you the satellite imagery where uh, we're sort of underneath this Pacific front that's been draped across central coastal sections for a couple of days now, uh, including that rainfall warning uh, for central coastal sections and we are hearing that several homes have been evacuated from the river inlet area uh, bc uh, river forecast center saying 80 to 150 millimeters more expected specifically for the bella bella and ocean falls area through the next uh, 24 hours uh, so we are looking at rivers rising quite rapidly in response to all of this rain and it really has just been draped across this area uh, for almost 48 hours now look at the rainfall accumulation through to friday morning that's where we're looking to get that additional 100 plus millimeters and it really is focused from prince rupert down towards the top of the sunshine coast Friday is when that system will finally sink south. So we will catch a break for coastal areas, but not until Friday. It's Thursday overnight into Friday that we'll get some of that rain here in Vancouver. So tomorrow night we'll be awaiting a final punch of rain rather than drizzle. I uh, just want to show you the temperatures quickly out there. It is still chilly, 12 at YVR. Uh, we're going to go down to close to the single digits, but we're, we've got a couple of warm days ahead of us. So I'll take us through a mild but wet Thursday and look at that weekend forecast coming up. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you again in a bit. Well, COVID-19 has put a stop to many celebrations, but not even the pandemic could halt the annual kickoff to the Royal Canadian Legion's poppy campaign today. Your Honour, on behalf of BC Yukon Command of the Royal Canadian Legion, it's my pleasure to present you with the first poppy of the 2020 poppy campaign. BC's Lieutenant Governor Janet Austin accepted the first poppy from the Legion, which officially starts the campaign two weeks out from Remembrance Day. The ceremony is normally held inside Government House, but was outside this year because of COVID-19 and ongoing renovations. Austin says it's still important to honor our veterans and serving military members regardless of the pandemic. It's very sad. You know, I do miss the opportunity to um, to, to greet more people and, and to share in this uh, important uh, milestone uh, in our annual calendar. Um, but um, we all, you know, as, as Dr. Henry says, it's for now, it's not forever. Austin says the annual Remembrance Day ceremony at Government House will be mostly virtual this year. And a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC GEM app. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram.
Well, gyms in B.C. are open, but in many parts of the country, they are still off limits. Coming up, what one Ontario fitness chain is asking its members to do so they can reopen. And thanks for staying with us online during our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, it's a big milestone for someone who's lived an incredible life. A Toronto woman is celebrating her 90th birthday. Molly Applebaum is a published author and a Holocaust survivor. Talia Ricci gives us a glimpse inside her virtual birthday party. To have a Holocaust survivor who is still alive and able to share her story is getting fewer and fewer. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons why so many people wanted to make Molly Applebaum feel special on her 90th birthday. The fact that people, you know, from public life, in addition to your family, would come to say happy birthday um, can fill you with pride because that's because you've lived a very important life. Birthdays are joyous celebrations that provide a glimpse into the highlights of one's life. A virtual Who celebration does? recognized uh, the milestone yeah, and honored her accomplishments. Molly Applebaum honestly has written one of the most important, insightful and extraordinary books about the Holocaust, and I don't think it's got the recognition it deserves. Years ago, Applebaum wrote off her childhood diary as just the scribblings of a young girl. A number of years later, a friend of mine was doing some research on the Holocaust. And I asked my mother if there was anything interesting in her scribblings. And she said, I don't think so. She said, here, you take it. And my friend had a small portion of it translated because it was all written in Polish. And he contacted me and he says, I think we have something important here. The entries were fully translated and published for the world to read and experience. A story of survival and living in hiding. Students are completely blown away by the book. I mean, first of all, the book is so unusual because it combines a diary that Molly wrote when she was 13, 14 years old, most of that time hidden in a box in a barn with her cousin on a farm in German-occupied Poland. And there's even some facsimiles of the diary pages that are included, so you can see her handwriting. Three children, six grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren later, it's clear Applebaum values family, especially as she offers this advice. You should tell your children and your grandchildren that you love them and they are good-looking and they are smart. Don't keep it to yourself. You have to tell them over and over. Her daughter hoping this birthday was a highlight during the difficult days of the pandemic. She's sad a lot of the time, and I think that for her to know how special she is, not just to us, but for her to see how special she is to so many other people. We love you, Baba. Love you. <laughs> Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Quite the life. All right, back in a few moments with uh, more national and international news, including a story out of Ontario where gyms there are asking their membership to try to help them reopen it's getting political we'll have that more in just a sec Gyms in B.C. are open, but in many parts of the country, they are still off limits. That's been the struggle for Canada's largest chain of gyms, which are dealing with closures in Toronto. As Ali Chieson reports, Good Life Fitness is now asking its members to get political to help them reopen. Canada's largest gym chain, Good Life, is urging its members to help them reopen. In an email blast, they write... You can help by sending a letter to your member of provincial parliament, which will serve to support the swift reopening of our closed clubs. They link two different letter templates and encourage, quote, the more personal stories they hear, the better. It's actually the Fitness Industry Council of Canada's idea. That does sound like lobbying. <laughs> it does, and that's what we do. <laughs> yes. Is it appropriate then for... Uh, individual gyms like Good Life asking their members to do that work? It is, absolutely. They argue gyms are about more than just pumping iron, getting toned. 
We would like to keep doing what we do, um, following sanitary protocols that are approved and that we can go back to serving our members. Because um, like I said, the physical health crisis is one, the mental health crisis is one that is another great concern to us. Is that gonna work on the provincial health minister? We have been advised by public health doctors that that is a place where uh, transmission is happening. So we're not going to change that uh, that regulation or rule for uh, it will stay in place for 28 days and then we'll see. That's a no for now. At the same time as all the good that gyms do, we did see outbreaks and closures because of cases among staff at gyms. So there was a couple of cases, we're not perfect. And that's despite increased sanitization and physical distancing measures. There's also that outbreak at a spin co in Hamilton now being linked to over 50 cases. The Fitness Industry Council of Canada, serving as the voice for over 6,000 struggling gyms right now, want to be part of the conversation. A conversation Mayor John Tory is open to. I think there can be a way found where in uh, certain circumstances, subject to certain conditions, uh, we could have uh, gyms reopen. But not until at least the second week of November. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. In Russia, outlying regions are bearing the brunt of the latest wave of coronavirus cases, and that's leading to crowding at healthcare facilities for both the living and the dead. Some of what our Chris Brown is about to show you may be disturbing. The horror stories about COVID-19 ravaging rural Russia are hard to watch. This video shows dozens of corpses in the basement of a hospital in the Siberian city of Novokuznets. It was arguably worse in Barnaul Hospital number 12. One of the bodies left out like that was Artemy Pachenko's aunt, Ludmila. He says by the time doctors told him and he got her body back 10 days later, it was bloated and unrecognizable. We were hoping it would be more civilized, that her body was refrigerated somewhere, not just left like this on the floor. Marriott Sertsevo got COVID and, in a social media post, said she was turned away from a Barnaul hospital. Incredibly, doctors told her to go home and to blow into a balloon to strengthen her lungs. One of the worst stories has come out of Rostov-on-Don, where 13 patients on ventilators died when the hospital there ran out of oxygen. Today, two senior administrators were fired. This doctor and professor says he sees little relief for rural Russia's cash-starved healthcare system. Uh, in general, in Russia, things are going to worse, um, but on, on what a scale, uh, it is difficult to uh, estimate. As for Russia's much-hyped vaccine, Sputnik V, it's still in stage three trials and slower at generating data than some of its Western competitors. But the promises about how it will soon save the country continue. We will administer the vaccine to 70% of the country. And within 10 to 12 months, Russia will make this disease vaccine manageable, said its creator, Alexander Ginsberg. In the meantime, there's a frantic effort to find beds. In hard hit Barnaul, that even means converting a shopping center into a COVID ward. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Celebration today in Australia's second biggest city. The coronavirus lockdown has ended in Melbourne after almost four months. So I now officially declare Melbourne restaurants open for business. <laughs> Retail stores, restaurants and beauty salons opened their doors for business today. The restrictions that were imposed back in July paid off in the city, which was formerly a COVID-19 hotspot. The state of Victoria, in which Melbourne is located, reported just two new COVID-19 cases today. No infections were reported in the preceding two days. A riots broke out on the streets of Italy's capital overnight. It's the latest escalation in nationwide protests against COVID-19 restrictions. New closures took effect on Sunday as the second wave grows in that country. Almost 25,000 new cases of COVID-19 were reported there today alone as a stark new record and more than 200 new deaths. Megan Williams has more on the surging anger from Rome. 
Behind me here in Rome, you can see Piazza del Popolo, People's Square, where the clashes between police and rioters took place last night with about 12 people arrested. Now, police say most of those people out belong to the far-right neo-fascist political group Forza Nuova. They have also been present in other protests throughout Italy in the past week. <laughs> Another group that has infiltrated protests is the uh, Camorra Mafia group in Naples. They attacked police, they attacked journalists. The Mafia is upset that nightclubs have closed in Italy with the latest restrictions and restaurants and bars close at 6 o'clock. There's also a curfew in, in the region surrounding Naples. That means their drug sales are way down and they also have a long history of trying to inflame social tensions so that people lose trust in the central government. In northern Italy, the city of Turin, there have been protests as well. There, a lot of uh, restaurant owners, shop owners, they were out upset, of course, uh, at, at what these new restrictions are doing to businesses. They have been calling for uh, more support. Some of that came yesterday as uh, Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte announced a new set of measures, almost $7 billion in tax refunds, other initiatives to try and help out uh, businesses that are in real trouble as Italy uh, is in this state of restrictive measures and with a lot of concern that there will be a full-on lockdown. Now it's worth saying that most Italians either fully support these restrictive measures or would like even stricter measures because uh, having been through what this country went through in, um, in the spring with uh, almost 35,000 deaths at that point, Italians are very concerned of what, the, at what this could mean for the country. Only about a quarter of Italians actually oppose uh, the current set of restrictions. Megan Williams, CBC News, Rome. Turning to the U.S., where Joe Biden and Donald Trump are addressing violence in Philadelphia, where protests have been taking place after the latest police shooting of a black American. The CBC's Stephen D'Souza reports, and we do want to warn you, some of the video may be disturbing. For the last two nights, protesters have marched through Philadelphia, while looters have run unchecked. The anger and violence fueled by the death of Walter Wallace Jr. Today, stores were boarded up and residents picked up the pieces. This is not the way to display your anger towards what's going on. At least 30 officers have been injured, dozens of people arrested. Yo, crazy on me. New video shows the shocking final moments of Wallace Jr.'s life. Police confronted him on Monday. He had a knife and a history of mental illness. The two officers fired 14 times. Police say Wallace Jr. refused to drop the knife. His family was watching. They say they called 911 for help for a mental health crisis. Unfortunately, the officers were not equipped with A, the training, or B, the proper equipment. The mayor today promised 911 calls and body camera footage will be released in the near future. Walter Wallace Sr. called for answers and calm. I don't condone no violence, tearing up the city, looting up the stores, and all this chaos going. The shooting and its aftermath comes during a heated presidential election in which Donald Trump has used images of violence and looting on American streets to motivate his supporters. A Democrat-run state, a Democrat-run city, Philadelphia. We don't have that. We don't have it. The Republicans don't have it. There is no excuse whatsoever for the looting and the violence. None whatsoever. Residents promise the protests will continue. We protested for George Floyd. You better believe we're going to protest for our own citizen of our neighborhood. The city has imposed a curfew, setting the stage for another tense night on Philadelphia's streets. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Still to come tonight, a warning from the head of Fraser Health as COVID-19 cases surge in that region. That's next.
Uh, Michael J. Fox, of course, did his best in Back to the Future to make skateboarding look really nifty, but a lot of pedestrians and motorists find it a major hazard. But now there's someone in Vancouver who is trying to make skateboarding respectable. <laughs> Anyone over 30 probably thinks this is a warm-up for a trip to the emergency ward. But in fact, it's a school for skateboarders. The first ever in Vancouver. John Krieger and Steve Corcoran are holding it at the Kitsilano Community Center. We're trying to teach these kids um, some of the ground rules of safety, uh, good board handling, and uh, just upgrade their board skills. Now John is the envy of all. Just look at him on the board. He wants to turn pro and make it into the big time. Basically, turning pro means that you endorse uh, your own skateboard model and you can accept professional prize money, which is up, up to $1,000 a contest for the big contest. But when you're top dog, there's always a challenger. Eight-year-old Michael Johnstone hasn't been on the boards long. He's got some big ideas. How good would you like to get? Real good. Pretty pro. Would you like to get as good as John? Yeah. yeah I don't think he's going to make it. Maybe. Nope. You think you're going to be better than he is someday? Yeah. Definitely. Who knows? One of them just might make it. But in the meantime, it's back to class. You have to pay your dues first. Bob Gillingham, CBC News. Officially, Costco is a wholesale outlet, a low-service, low-overhead warehouse-type store. You buy cases of what you want for cash. No credit cards, not a frill in sight. It's supposed to be a place where small retailers can come to take advantage of a big organization's buying power, all for the cost of a membership. I can save uh, money, I can save costs. In today's market, you've got to save costs. Take it over there, don't bring it back to me. But Costco also sells memberships to any consumer who falls into the right categories. And the categories are so loose, they include just about everybody. That puts the wholesale store into the retail game. Uh, we're always asked the question, from whom do we take our business? And the answer is, we don't know, because it's spread over such a wide base, because we carry so many products. Most of the people who came for the first day of shopping were just ordinary consumers looking for a bargain. The store claims to sell 10 to 30 percent less than other discount stores because of its low overhead. It's a more efficient way of merchandising and of uh, merchandising standardized products. So uh, you're going to find that they're going to cut into a competition of the, uh, the big chain stores and the big... Uh, Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Dr. Bonnie Henry is reporting 287 new cases of COVID-19 in BC tonight and two new deaths. There are 2,316 active cases, 87 people in hospital, 17 more than last Wednesday, with 25 in intensive care. With today's deaths, the provincial death toll stands at 261. 66% of the new cases are in the Fraser Health region, which includes Surrey. We will be monitoring the situation very closely and we will enact additional measures if necessary. But we hope and we believe in British Columbians that we will be able to bend the curve again. The hard hit Fraser Health region says if COVID cases keep going up, tighter restrictions could be coming. And health officials are urging people to keep private gatherings at residences to just household members only. And joining us now is Fraser Health Region President and CEO, Dr. Victoria Lee. Dr. Lee, thanks for uh, joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Now, I want to ask you, when it comes to uh, private gatherings, as you've heard, Dr. Bonnie Henry's recent order limits gatherings in private residences to household members plus a so-called safe six, but uh, as we saw at the beginning of this newscast, your region thinks that's perhaps still too risky and you're going a step further. You're saying no safe six, just household members only. I mean, is it realistic to think people are gonna follow that guideline? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. For Fraser Health, we have been seeing a very rapid and concerning increase in COVID-19 cases. And to ensure that uh, we are protecting our communities, loved ones, and schools and businesses, we're asking everybody, in addition to the measure that's been put in place by the government and Dr. Bon Bonnie Henry, uh, to ask everyone for now to minimize social interactions at home by not having events or parties at home. You can still socialize with your safe six in a licensed facility such as restaurants and hotels. All right, still though, it, it, it seems a lot of people, at least right now, uh, particularly in Surrey, are ignoring uh, health orders and guidelines. Uh, Dr. Henry specifically referenced that area, talking about larger gatherings, uh, weddings, celebrations of life, gender reveal parties. How do you stop people from playing it fast and loose when they don't care or perhaps don't understand what they're doing is dangerous? Yeah, I think uh, wave one has shown us that we are all in this together and most people have the right intentions and do want to do the right thing. The measures that have been escalating in BC, we've done a great job with Dr. Henry's leadership to escalate and progressively escalate as needed. And I think from wave one, we saw that everybody wants to do the right thing. We need to clarify what the messages are, what we need to do, and hence the provincial uh, strategy and measure that's been most recent around uh, safe six. In addition to that, uh, we are putting additional recommendation not to have private parties and events in household. You can still have your safe six in terms of social interactions, but not parties and events. Uh, we believe with those uh, clear messages out there, with the new public health order, uh, we can bend the curve again. We will be monitoring the situation very closely and we will enact additional measures if necessary. But we hope and we believe in British Columbians that we will be able to bend the curve again. Okay, let's talk about that a bit. Uh, once again today, the, the bulk of the new COVID-19 cases in BC are in your region. Uh, today, 66%. Yesterday, 67%. 81% uh, of the cases over the last week, and you are the biggest health region in the province, yes. of course, but uh, what, what do you mean by tighter restrictions? What, what could you possibly do? So, as you mentioned, we have been seeing increasing number of cases and uh, concerning trends, and we are the biggest region, and ha we have most populous and most dense population as well. Uh, I think what's reassuring, if we put it in the context, we still have lower uh, cases per million population when we compare it to the rest of Canada, places like Quebec. Escalating measures would look like, um, do we restrict further uh, household gatherings, further restriction of number of people? I think there's also areas that we can do more. Currently, we're working with WorkSafe BC municipalities and other business partners to uh, actually do more preventive and proactive work with businesses and work sites where we've seen transmission of COVID-19 as well. So it's a comprehensive mechanism that we're looking at, not only uh, additional measures in terms of uh, public health orders, but also training, education, and working with our partners. All right. Well, hopefully it doesn't come to that, but we shall see. Uh, Dr. Lee, thanks so much for doing this tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Victoria Lee is President and CEO of the Fraser Health Region. Australian scientists have found a new coral reef just off the northeast tip of that country. It's enormous, huge in fact. So how did they miss it? That's coming up. 637, live shot, Science World, downtown Vancouver tonight. Another dark and pretty much soggy day on the south coast. So we did see some flares of sun in the sunset tonight. But you'll want to see what Johanna has in store for the weekend. Her forecast is next.
The Market Report is brought to you by Fortis BC. We've got even bigger rebates. Rebate. Whoa. On select high-efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time. The Bank of Canada is keeping its benchmark interest rate at 0.25%, and it plans to keep its rate low until the economy begins to improve. Peter Armstrong has more tonight on what Canada's top banker is saying about our economy's economic future. We expect the fallout from the pandemic will have some long-lasting effects on future economic growth. Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem laid things pretty bare today. It's going to be a long slog, he called it. The recovery is going to linger longer than anybody would have liked, and the effects of this are going to be felt for years to come. But, he says, the central bank is taking and will continue to take extraordinary measures to help nudge that recovery along. It will continue with quantitative easing, a sort of central bank alchemy that allows it to create money out of thin air and inject it into the economy. It will keep interest rates at what it calls the effective lower bound, essentially at zero for a very long time. But what was most interesting in this release was the clear messaging to Canadians. Central bank governors are best known for their impenetrable jargon-laden speeches on economic arcanity. Well, today, Macklem spoke with great clarity on what these moves mean for you, the Canadian consumer. You know, we're telling Canadians, uh, and, and our forward guidance has been very clear, that we're going to hold the interest, our policy interest rate at the effective lower bound until slack is absorbed so that we can sustainably achieve our 2% uh, inflation target. And we've indicated that's not going to happen into some time into 2023. So what does that mean? Yes, it means that if you're a household considering making a major purchase, uh, if you're a business considering investing, uh, you can be confident that interest rates will be low for a long time. Now, at the heart of this lies the certainty that this recovery will be driven by consumers. So the bank is saying it will do everything in its considerable power to help those consumers through the worst of it and make sure there's at least some certainty around the cost of borrowing money through a very uncertain time. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Firefighters in California are still reporting extreme fire weather conditions in Orange County tonight, but they say weaker winds late today will help them expand containment lines. The fires erupted Monday, stirred up by fierce winds coming in from the desert. The winds eased yesterday, but not before thousands of acres were charred. Evacuations are still in progress. So far, California's intense wildfire season has left 31 people dead. And Johanna Wagstaff is back with us, uh, also keeping an eye on the situation there. Is there any uh, positive news on the horizon there? The winds easing, Mike, have been huge. In fact, over the past uh, sort of 12 hours, firefighters have really gained control over those two fires. Still only 25% and 15% contained, but growing much more slowly. I want to show you the uh, only watchers and warnings in place across California because all the red flag, all of the wind warnings have ended. So even though it's bone dry, we're not looking at any rain in the forecast. Temperatures are still in the mid-20s. At least we don't have those winds. But notice the air quality. Those winds yesterday, gusting over 100 kilometers per hour, actually whipped soot from those fires all the way up through central and northern uh, California, making it, uh, giving it some of the worst air quality in the world. So those air quality statements still in effect. Uh, we're getting the rain up north. This is the kind of system that California would uh, love to get. An atmospheric river uh, just pulsing central coastal sections, sort of like a train, you could say. Cue sound effects, please. Uh, yes, a train of moisture moving into central coastal sections, as we mentioned earlier. That is where we have the flood warnings in place. But watch as I take you through the forecast. That's sort of the warm front of a system. We almost see the twisting as the low comes on shore for Thursday overnight, looking to move on shore just north of Fort Hardy. And then we'll get that cold front slide in to the south of us. So 
A very interesting action Thursday into Friday. We'll see that rain pulse back up into Terrace and Stewart where you get some snow and then the cold front moving down in through the south coast. So that's our best chance of some steady rain is Thursday overnight into Friday morning before this whole system uh, moves southeastward and we get a nice clear out behind that cold front. In the warm pocket, though, temperatures are quite warm, even though it's uh, chilly out there in the evenings. Uh, 13s tomorrow for the valley and out towards the southern interior. And I think Vancouver, we could hit uh, 13s in through parts of the city for tomorrow as well. Cooling down a little bit on Friday. It's Friday overnight that we'll really notice uh, the cool down behind that cold front. A, a clear and cool weekend forecast. Here's what it looks like. Thursday, I've just got the risk of a few showers in there through the day. More of that drizzly stuff we've had today. Not ruling out a peak of the sun through the afternoon. Victoria saw some of that sun today. Uh, so I think we've got a chance of some rays. A Thursday overnight into Friday, though, that's when we get into that steady rain. It's short-lived, though. I think maybe early Friday we'll have some lingering showers, but clearing out for a gorgeous Friday afternoon. And then we're in this cold and clear high-pressure system, just a degree or so below our seasonal uh, sunshine for Saturday and Sunday. And look at that. Saturday overnight into Sunday, dropping into single digits, but by sort of peak trick-or-treat hours, uh, however you're doing it this year. It won't be too chilly as of yet. I'm very pleased that the least we could give you this year is a dry forecast. Uh, looks like uh, increasing cloud on Monday and then rain returns for the back end of the week. Just taking a quick look at that long range forecast. Uh, you can see that cold air a bit descends for Saturday and Sunday, but then look at this Sunday into early next week. Uh, things come right back up to above seasonal. In fact, a uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm seeing some signs of a little, uh, mid-teen warm-up so we'll keep, keep you posted on that that's the forecast all laid out for you so if you didn't think the natural world held any more secrets for you mike i'm excited to talk about this <laughs> next story australian scientists might be convincing you otherwise they have found a new coral reef off the northeast tip of australia yes it's an enormous structure in fact so big the question is how did they miss it here's greg rasmussen Look down, way down. We're just starting to come up the base of this, uh, this 500 meter reef. Mapping the seabed off the Australian coast, researchers came across a big surprise, a really big surprise. And nobody knew that this was here. If you imagine, if you took the Grand Canyon and added on the Niagara Falls times two, and then flooded that with seawater, and stuck a coral reef on top. The newly discovered reef towers 500 meters off the sea floor, coming up to within just 40 meters of the surface. There's a whole lot of information locked up in these rocks that we can un uncover uh, back in the lab. It's millions of years old, layers of reef and other geological structures holding secrets from the past. A really remarkable landscape. It's like I have never seen such an amazing seafloor. The, the submarine canyons that are steeper and deeper here than any other part of the Great Barrier Reef. Researchers used this remotely operated vehicle, nicknamed Sebastian, to explore and gather samples hundreds of meters below the surface. Oh, ah, what's this? Is it's a cone shell. shell. It's a cone shell and it's got its proboscis out. The research group funding the expedition will spend years analyzing what they've found. A lot of the waters we're diving on, it's the first time anyone's looked at these regions, and we are finding all kinds of new things. With much of Australia's Great Barrier Reef dying due to climate change, scientists say studying this underwater seascape will help reveal what happened when oceans changed dramatically in the past. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Quite the uh, impressive discovery. I, it's like it's 500 meters, rising 500 meters. That's like the Empire State Building in New York. It's it's gigantic. That's a great comparison. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, it's wild that it was right there off the coast. This is the news we could use in 2020. I, I feel like. Well, especially when you consider what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef. Exactly. Exactly. All right, back with you in just a sec, Joe. But the pandemic may be scary. But it doesn't mean having Halloween fun at this time needs to be scary. We'll have some tips for keeping safe during these spooky times next.
My name is Andre Kenville, and I'm the general manager here at Mount Norquay. So the first thing you'll notice is when you arrive at Mount Norquay, you'll be greeted by a, a, an attendant here. who will ask you a couple of questions regarding your, your health, and uh, he'll inform you of some of the things that we're doing here, such as uh, mandatory masks and sanitization and different protocols that are in place now. We will be requesting that folks have pre-purchased the lift ticket. Season's pass holders are already registered in our systems, so when they do arrive, we scan their tickets and we know who's here. This will allow us to uh, understand how many people we have on site and also be able to uh, contact Trace if need be. Services like rental equipment and ski school lessons are still available. What you'll see in our rental shops is, is signage that's going to indicate where you should be standing, sanitization stations, and our staff will be behind some plexiglass guards. Equipment rentals typically go out one time a day. As they come in, they're sanitized, they're stored, and they're reused the next day. So when you arrive in our day lodges, uh, you'll see that we've set up entrances and exits along with additional signage to inform you of what to expect when you enter the buildings. Inside the lodges, you'll see uh, tables spaced out to the appropriate two meter distancing. Washroom doors are left open so that people can go in and out and use them uh, without needing to touch anything. And uh, we have an additional amount of hand sanitization stations inside our lodge as well. Our food and beverage outlets are still open. We have the appropriate guards for our staff uh, so they have the protection they require in order to serve the food. Menu options have changed slightly to allow for a quicker service to reduce lineups and, and get people warmed up and fed as quickly as possible. So once you get out onto the slopes, what you'll see is some additional signage to instruct you to continue to wear your mask while you're in lineup for the ski lift. When you're on the chairlift as well, what you won't see this year is a singles lineup. So we're asking that people who arrive together ride the lifts together. And uh, obviously on some of our lifts, physical distancing is already part of how it works, such as a conveyor lift here. As you'll see in our lift lines, people will be spaced out between the tips of their skis and the tails of their skis. There'll be signage along and some visual indicators, such as the bamboo sticks that you see, to help people understand the space they need to keep. And our lift attendants will continuously remind people to wear their masks as they wait in line and load the chairlifts. Once they get up onto the chair and out onto the slopes though, you'll notice that there's quite a bit of space for people to, uh, to keep their space and enjoy some, some good times outdoors. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Don't miss this year's Vancouver Podcast Festival. Join Faith Fundell, host of They and Us, and various CBC podcasters at this year's festival from the comfort of your own home. And join Gloria Makarenko for the 65 Roses Six Feet Away Soiree, a virtual experience in support of Cystic Fibrosis Canada. Get your tickets today at 65rosesgala.com and enjoy an evening of celebration. Okay, a church in Nanus Bay has set up a pet cemetery of sorts. People can go and give their companions a final resting place. Not far from St. Mary's Anglican Church, a memorial garden has been set up for pets. The idea came to the church's reverend while she was on a pilgrimage in England and came across huge pet cemeteries. That pet memorial garden made a big impression on me. And we have a lot of pet lovers here at St. Mary's, um, people for whom their pet is an integral part of the family. Yeah, a lot of people feel that way. Pets' ashes mm -hmm. are put right into the garden, and you can buy a nameplate for about $50. The Memorial Garden, named after St. Francis, the patron saint of animals. There you go. We won't talk about that too much because that'll make us cry, Mike, as dog it will. owners, yes. But I, good story. Um, Halloween is just around the corner, of course, <laughs> which means lots of candy to enjoy. Lots and lots. Of course, chocolate won't be a cure for COVID-19, but the Belgian chocolate maker deemed the world's best pastry chef says it can provide a lot of comfort in gloomy times. Ça fait plaisir en soirée, et puis c'est juste du bonheur. 
According to Pierre Marcolini, chocolate is a pure pleasure. It's just happiness. And he's an expert, having been crowned the world's best by a jury of independent reporters at an international chef's competition. Mm, his confections are luxury gifts, and he works with only the finest cocoa beans, of course, from around the world. At 56, he's been in business in Belgium, a nation renowned for its chocolate for 25 years. Lots of chocolate wow. in the forecast this weekend. Yes, I mean, I would take Belgian chocolate. Oh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Uh, while the pandemic might be scary, this Halloween doesn't have to be. Yes, our GP Mendoza spoke to BC Health officials who have these tips to keep you safe while trick-or-treating. COVID-19 has hampered many celebrations this year, but PC health officials have been saying Halloween can still be fun without putting your health at risk. Here's some tips doctors are recommending you do to keep your Halloween celebration scary while being safe. If you're not comfortable having people come up to your doors, keep your house and porch lights off so families know to skip your place. However, if you are open for trick-or-treating, try coming up with creative ways to be COVID safe. Try putting up signage or markings on the ground for people to wait while kids get their treats. Officials are also asking to avoid using smoke or fog machines in your Halloween displays as they can cause coughing. You'll want to use tongs or a baking sheet to give yourself more space between people when handing out candy. You should also hand out individual pre-packaged treats instead of leaving out a shared bowl. We've also seen people DIY their own candy shoots like these. Try including a non-medical mask or a face covering as part of your costume. If your mask doesn't have any holes like mine does, don't double up. Officials say it might make it harder to breathe. You should keep your trick-or-treating group small and with people in your social bubble. If you're digging into your candy haul on the go, keep hand sanitizer with you. Officials say you don't have to clean every single piece of candy you pick up, but instead sanitize your hands after handling your treats and keep from touching your face. Avoid large parties and indoor gatherings, and this year plan to stay in your neighborhood. Don't go visiting an area too far from your home. And those are some tricks to help make this Halloween a little less scary. Oh, I love the Dr. Bonnie Henry skeleton there on the... Uh, I know. The <laughs> it's really... <laughs> so good. Really, have you got a trick-or-treating plan? Yeah, my one-and-a-half-year-old does not un really understand the concept, but he's got a dog costume, and I will be uh, eating the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups from our local neighborhood. So uh, I've got a great Saturday night you got plan. A, you're all set. You're all set. Yeah. We're just going to buy <laughs> the candy and then turn off the lights more for me, I guess. Right? <laughs> That's also a great plan. Exactly. I think other people should maybe think about that one. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Dan's here at 11. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.